So the plan for today is, uh, I'll start with one of the topics from algorithm design, which is has lot of applications. Uh, it's called network flow. I'll start with it, and I'll try to finish this by 10:45, 10:30 or 10:45. Then we'll take a break for half an hour. Then we'll start um, some geometric data structures. So that's the overall plan. And uh, so I'll give you a brief idea of the basic algorithm to find a network flow. But uh, this is kind of a, the algorithm that I'll present is a slow alg algorithm. And also, if, I, if time permits, I would like to give you an idea of the faster algorithm. The algorithm that I'll present is a pseudo polynomial time algorithm. I'll explain what is a pseudo polynomial time algorithm is. It's not a polynomial time algorithm in true sense. But I'll try to give you an idea, if time permits, I'd like to give you an idea of, uh, of a polynomial time algorithm for this problem. Also, I would uh, like to give you some idea of the application of the network flow problem. I'll start with some applications, but uh, those are not only applications of network flow. This, has a, uh, this problem has applicability in many domains of algorithm design. I'll try to give you some hints of them. If I'm not able to do that in this, like before 10.30 or 10.45, what I'll do is, in the first tutorial session, I'll propose two problems from different domains, which can be solved using network flow. Then you'll have an idea that how this algorithm can be used for any other problems. All good? OK. So let's start. Suppose there is, uh, you know that the oils needs to be transported from one place to the other place. Suppose there is a oil pipeline which, which delivers oil to Kozikor and it's coming from Delhi. There is a straight pipeline from Delhi to Kozikor. It may be oil, it may be gas, it may be water. So this pipeline has a capacity. That means per minute, there is a certain amount of flow that it can allow to pass. So someone has to monitor that, how much oil or water we should push so that this pipeline should not break. So if the capacity is, say, 150 barrels per liter, one should not push beyond 150 barrels per liter. This is easy. Someone sitting in Delhi can monitor that what is the amount of flow that we are allowing. Is it less than 150? We are all good. If it is tending to more than 150, we should not allow that. Fairly easy question. Fairly simple solution. But in real life, these oil pipelines or these water pipelines are not this linear. There are many interconnections in between. This is actually oil network of India. And each of these lines may have several capacities associated with it. For example, consider the train lines. They have a capacity associated with each line. If there is a two lines, we can have at most two trains at a time. It's four, four lines, similarly for oil. This is the oil network for US. Now a single person sitting at Washington cannot decide how much flow to allow in every pipeline. Right? It's not just possible for a single person. There's no single measure, 150 barrels per liter is not enough. We're looking for a much more complex problem. Is the idea of the problem clear to everyone? So now we have a real life problem and how we, what we do, we try to model is 
model it as a well defined problem in a theoretical sense. So, what is the most general way to model this scenario is by a graph. Rather, I should I should say that a directed graph. Each edge of this gra graph has a direction. And for the time being, we will assume that between any two vertex, either there is a edge u to v or there is a edge from v to u, not both. Either we can push a flow from u to v or we can push a flow from v to u. This is our restriction. And we have our network and we would like to find out what is the maximum flow and we have a source and a destination. Source is S and destination is T and our objective is to find out how much flow I can push through S so that all the capacities they pose a constraint on the amount of flow that I can push through S. What is the maximum flow that I can push through S so that all the capacity constraints are being satisfied. That there should not be a flow in any edge which is greater than that of its capacity. So, this is the overview of the problem that we would like to solve. Okay. And one more uh, restriction is also there that there is no edge which is coming to sink the source sorry there is no edge coming to source there is no incoming edge to S and there is no in outgoing edge to T. So, there is no edge if you can see that in this example there is no edge like this this is not allowed this kind of edges are not present. Similarly, there is no incoming edge to S that is this is not allowed these are the following restrictions a flow network is described with four tuples. So, with edge each we have a graph and with edge each edge there is a capacity constraint, there is a capacity associated with it, there is a source, there is a sink and no edge enters source and no edge leaves the sink. Problem definition clear, this is the things that are given to you. Now, I have give you an overview, an overview of the problem. So, if I think about the problem what we are trying to find? We are trying to find a flow. How mathematically we can model flow? It is just a function or a value that we are assigning to each edge. Each flow is nothing but a value that I am assigning to each edge, but with certain constraints. What is the first constraint that I have mentioned? I am not allowed to push flow through a edge which is more than the capacity. This is called the capacity constraint. So, this is this is a function that we are looking for that is f of e. And for each edge E, f of E should be less than equals to capacity of the edge that is C of E. And we should also follow another constraint that if I suppose push a flow, here I push 20, here I push say 10, here I push 10, here I push 10. Here I push 10. Now, this is a typical flow looks like. What is the other constraint is? I am assuming that there is no storage facility available at the nodes that I am not allowed to store anything. So, I am pushing 10 to this vertex V1 and I have to push 10 out of V1 as well. It is not, it is not possible that I push 5 into V 1 and I push 3 
and there is no question of pushing 5 and taking 10 out of it. So, this is a exact constraint that the total flow which is coming into a vertex should be equal to the total flow which is going out of the vertex. <coughs> Clear? It is very natural. That is what we do. So, suppose I have a function which satisfies these two conditions. So, we will call it a flow. But we have to find out how good the flow is. There should be a measure of how much I am able to push 2 t. What is that amount? Summation of the flows that is going out of S or summation of the flows that is going into T. This is the two quantities which describes a flow. For this lecture, we will only take the summation out of S for the convenience. There is nothing, you can take a T, everything goes in the same way. Are you with me? This is call the value of the flow and we will denote it by val f. So, what is the obvious algorithmic question here? That that operator sitting in Delhi, what is his objective is to push the maximum flow because that will create the maximum revenue. With all this constraint, the question is what is the maximum flow that we can push through the network. Clear? Very good. So, this is a typical example of a flow network where this 50 denotes the capacity and 20 denotes the flow. So, whatever in slash red is the flow that I have pushed through that edge and throughout the presentation I will follow this convention. Is it okay? So, I push 20 here, what is the flow coming to A? 20. What is the flow out of A? What is the flow coming to C? What is the flow going out of uh, C? D? 20 through this, 10, 10 through this. Clear? So, it is satisfied and you can see that all the flows, all the values associated, the, all the flow values associated with each edge are less than the that of the capacity. So, we have satisfied the capacity constraint and we have satisfied the flow conservation constraint as well. Clear? So, the question now. So, someone has presented with this problem and someone came out with a solution, someone just like you. Now, you tell me how to solve this problem. Yes, true. You have a very hun good hunch about how to solve problems. His idea is that it can be solved using a linear programming problem. How many constraints will be there? Think about that. It definitely can be solved using the linear programming, but think about this. But we are not pre today present our linear programming solution. A trivial solution, how a layman will solve? Suppose you are an operator sitting at Delhi, how you will solve? Greedy? You, so, you, you know what is a greedy algorithm is? Please raise your hand if you do not know what a greedy algorithm is. 
Okay? So, you two do not know what is be greedy, that is the algorithm. Nothing difficult. So, what you will do? What do you suggest? Can you push 10 in this network? Forget about 30, 40. Can you push 10? Can you push 10 flow 10, flow of unit 10 from S to T? Hmm? Yes? What do you think? Just 10. Yes? How? So, let us call this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and T. What I need to do? When I say that I can push 10 bit from S to T, a flow of value 10 from S to T. So, yeah, that is true. So, what we are trying to do, we can, what we can try to do, we try to find the ST path, a path between S and T in this graph such that in every edge the capacity is at least 10. Right? For example, I can, can I push 10 here? Can I push 10 here? Can I push 10 here? Is it okay? What about 10 more? Can I push 10 more from S to T? Same path will not work. Right? The scheme is clear. You understand why I am calling it greedy? I am trying to find a path where I can push some flow. And when I am pushing the flow, what is happening? The capacity of that edge is reducing by that amount. And I keep continue doing this till I am stuck or there is no ST path remains in the graph. Fairly simple algorithm. This is the algorithm. Have a look. So, have you done a poor, done a BFS? If you have to find a path, so if there is a positive flow remains, positive capacity remains, that edge will remain in the graph. One, if it is saturated, it will, will delete it from the graph. So, it will become 0. So, you have given a unweighted graph, unweighted directed graph. Now, you are finding, try to find a path from S to T. How to do that? DFS or BFS? Looking for one path. If I want a shortest path, then unweighted shortest path in a graph, in a directed graph. BFS, we will do BFS. If I want any path, whether there is a path or not, DFS, BFS, both will work. Clear? So, everyone knows BFS, right? Yesterday it was covered in the class. So, I will assume that we will do BFS to find out the path. Doubts? Please raise your hand if you have a doubt regarding this. Clear? Doubts? Okay. So, suppose this is our network that we are given. First, we choose this path. 
we push 10 along the edges, then 10 more along the edges. But still can we push? Does there exist a path? Yes, we have another path. We push. No, the figure is not complete. I think we can push 20 here, 20 more. Now, we cannot push anything through this network, we are done. Right? Because after these two points, both the edges are saturated. We cannot push anything. Even if we reach these two points, say G and F, we are not able to push anything beyond G and F, because the edges from G to T and F to T are already saturated. So far, the algorithm works. Consider this network. Let us try to do the same algorithm. So, this is the path I choose. I will push 10 because what is the minimum capacity is 10. Next, I choose this path. What I choose is Again I choose 10. Now question is can I choose, can I push any more flow to the graph? This graph, first this path push 10, then this path push 10 more. Now we have reached to this graph. Can we push any more flow from S to T? These are the saturated edges. These edges has, has saturated their values. We cannot push any value through these edges. Good question. Can we push back? But before that, have we achieved the maximum flow here? What is the maximum we can push from S to T? 30, right? Because I will take this path and this path. But how much we have pushed? Where we have done wrong? Choice. But can we backtrack? What do I mean by backtracking? Where we are stuck? We can see that we have pushed a flow 10 here, which we have forwarded through here. If somehow there is an option to us that we will push this 10 back to A and forward it to this direction. I will push back this 10 flow that A has sent to B, I will push back and forward it to in this direction because there is a 10 capacity free here, right. But there is a 10 flow going out of B, how I will compensate that? I can compensate that by pushing a flow from S to B of value 10, because there is a capacity free. Clear? Where is the deadlock in the previous case? That there is a flow from A to B, which blocking the way from B to T. My objective is if somehow I can push back the flow from B to A, that is 10 that I have pushed, 
so that I can push it through A to T because there is a 10 capacity left there. But there is one single problem is there that I need to push at least 10 flow, flow of value 10 to B because there is an outflow from B of 10 units. Who will provide that? I can see that there is an edge between S to B which can provide that 10 flow. But now look at this purple edges. This is the changes that I have made. What do they create? Does it look similar? It looks like a ST path. It looks like a path between S and T. Right? It looks like a path between S and T. From S to B, B to A, A to T. <coughs> but not in the original graph. Why? Because in the original graph, there is no edge from B to A. But while pushing a flow from A to B, we created a way, we created a structure so that the amount of flow that is coming to B, we can push back. That in some sense created a reverse arc, a edge from B to A. They have pushed 10 value from A to B in my flow. So there is a provision of sending back that 10 value from B to A. This is what we call the residual network with respect to a flow. We will define it formally. But the idea is clear? This is called a residual flow. But the idea is clear? Okay. Okay. So what we have? We have a flow. We have a flow F. From that, our objective is to create a residual graph. How we create? The spatial structure that we create is the reverse edge. Suppose we have an edge from U to V and along that path there is a positive flow, say value 10, then we will create a reverse edge from V to U of capacity 10. Also, what should I do for a forward edge that suppose u and v is part of the graph, how much you can push along that is the capacity minus the flow, right. Suppose consider our edge like that where the capacity is 15 and we have pushed how much flow 10. So what will be the remaining capacity in U and V? What is the capacity of V to U? How much we can push back? 10, right? This is how we are creating a new network. We started with a graph. We got some flow. From that, we got a new network. Right? You can see that by this you will get a new network but a modified one and with some certain small changes. What are those changes? In the original graph we have assumed that if there is a uv there is no edge vu in the graph which is not satisfied here but that is okay. We assume that there is no flow into S, but there may be a flow into S now. There may be an edge into S right now. Because if we push a value 10 from S, in the residual network, we will have from say S to V, we have pushed 10 value. 
Then in the residual network, we have edge from V to S of capacity 10. These are the differences between the previous network and the original network. But this is again a flow network with this small changes other than that this is still a flow network. And we can again ask the question how much flow in this new network I can push between S and T with the constraints what are the constraints the capacity constraint we should not push more than the capacity and how it translate to the original graph we should not push more than the remaining capacity and if it is a reverse edge we should not push more than the amount that we have pushed in the forward edge. So, this is capacity constraint what about flow constraint same there is no storage at the previous network there is no storage here. So, total capacity which enters a vertex V should total flow that is entering a vertex V should be equals to the total flow which is going out of that vertex V. Are we good till now? Okay. So this is the formal definition. Have a look. Started with one network, we created another network. Nothing complicated till now. And our objective remains the same to find the flow. So, this is an example of the previous network. Suppose this is our flow, this is our original graph, this is our residual network. So, S to A the capacity is 20 and we are pushing 20. So, what is the remaining capacity? 0. So, S to A 0 capacity. Okay. Sorry. So, A to S there will be a capacity of 20 because we have pushed 20 flow 20. Now, we are allowed to push back that 20 back to S. So, the reverse edge will have capacity 20. Similarly, we have 10 pushed, uh, we have capacity 10 along S and B, along the S, S and B. How much we have pushed? 0. How, what is the remaining capacity? 10. So, the forward edge will have capacity 10 and the backward edge will have capacity 0. Now, can you see a ST path in this residual network? We have seen this previously. This is the same thing that I have explained. We are seeing this little bit formally. The basic idea remains the same. So, I will push this back, push this back and I will have my optimal flow, but I do not know whether this is optimal or not yet. Right, but what is the new flow? Now, we have after pushing that 10, we get some new values. This is F is the original flow, F dash is the flow in the residual network and this with this complicated sign, I do not know with that sign is called let us call it plus f plus f dash is the new flow in the original network. I have to find out that this is f the actual flow that we have pushed plus the new flow along the forward edge minus the new flow along the backward edge. 
So, what is the original flow here along A and B? Hmm? Along the A and B, original flow 10. What is the flow in A and B here? 0 because the capacity is 0, so we cannot push anything. How much we have pushed back? What is the flow from B to A? 10. So, what is the actual value in the original network? Actual flow along the edge AB in the original network? 0. Do not go by this complicated notations. I am running out of notation, I am in a hurry, so I use this notation. Nothing complicated. Till now, are you with me? Is it clear what we are doing? Started with a network, we push a flow. When we can't, we create a residual network, which is another flow network. We try to push at that network. If we can, we update the flow and repeat the process till there is a ST path in the residual network. If there is no ST path, we claim that we have achieved the maximum flow. That is our claim without a proof. All okay. Next, we try to jump into the proof of this theorem. This is not a one page proof, this takes this proof technique will require at least few lemmas and few observations. Be patient, this is one of the most beautiful proof, proofs that I have seen. And there is a nice story behind the proof as well. <coughs> so, this is the formal claim that this complicated sing, uh, symbol f, complicated symbol f dash is actually a flow in the original network. And there is a proof for that, there is a, we are following both the converse, uh, like we are following the both the constraint. Are we following the capacity constraint? Trivial from the way we are pushing, we are never pushing beyond the capacity of the original network, we are never pushing back beyond what we have pushed during the flow. What about the flow constraint? You do some questions and you will see that you are actually not, you are actually satisfying that constraint as well. Do you want me to go through this? Or you can look at it and, so what is the value of this? This is equals to this. Right? Now, I can take the summation inside the bracket and I will get this expression, but this is exactly equals to this because this is a flow in F. We can reverse that because in the flow network it is in G. So, from now onwards, the graph will denote by G and the residual graph with respect to a flow F will denote by GF. This is in G. Why these two are equal? Because the con flow constraint satisfied in G, which says that total amount of flow into V is the total amount of flow out of V. Right? So, this implies this. Same for this, because f dash is a flow in 
gf total flow inside v is going inside v is total flow out of v so i have this equals to this similarly for this equals to this and again we reverse the sign take the everything inside and we get this says that total flow coming into v is total flow going out of v in f plus f dash so exactly says that you don't have to look into this go back try to prove it yourself it takes 2 minutes believe me okay <clears throat> now this is the idea of the algorithm it's just greedy start with the flow if you can't find the augmenting path find the flow push till you can find the flow in the augmenting path if you can't you have reached to a maximum flow still okay are you with me okay very nice so to prove the correctness of this algorithm we need some more notion of graph theory we need what is called a definition of a cut a cut what is a st cut it's nothing but the partition of the vertices into two boxes such that s is one box and t is in the other box this is the definition of a cut so this is the example the red vertices and the blue vertices red vertices are red block block box blue vertices are blue box and we have a cut there is a simple definition so what is the other way to visualize a cut it partitions s and v right suppose you have this and you have this these are the oil lines these are the oil lines and what you do you cut the network along this cut all the edges which are going from red to blue we just cut all the edges which are going from red to blue what will happen can there be any flow so you see that why i am bringing in cut there is some relation between the cut and the flow intuitively look at the capacity of this cut the amount of flow going into from one side to the other side can we push more than this no right intuitively think about this suppose i have a big network huge 100 say 100 so this is 100 this is s and this is t but in between there is a edge whose capacity is 10 can you is it possible to push more than 10 flow from s to t it creates some kind of a bottleneck a cut <coughs> create some kind of a bottleneck between s and t in terms of flow this is the basic idea and what is the value of a cut this is the definition the value of the cut is the sum of all the 
capacities which are going from A to B. Some of the capacities going from A to B, not B to A. That means the edge between A and B is not calculated while calculating the capacity of the cut. So, what is the capacity of this cut is 50. 20 plus 20 plus 10. Right? Similar to the flow, we can ask a similar question here. What is the minimum cut? Why? This problem was studied heavily during Cold War. You know what is a Cold War is? Was this is a famous conflict between USSR at that time and USA. So, what they are trying to convince people is that they are actually trying to find the maximum flow of the oil network in US. But what they are actually studying was in what is the minimum cost to disconnect the oil network in USSR. And it turns out that both these problems are actually seen. Right? This is a strategically very important question. That in what is the minimum number of places where I can cut so that a network breaks? It is true for oil network, true for telephone, true for internet, true for many other things. From strategic point of view, this is a very important question for any country. And turns out that both of them are actually the same question. That finding the maximum cut is same as find sorry finding the minimum cut is same as finding the maximum flow. This is what a min cut max flow theorem is. And that we are going to prove. Okay. So, but before that, we first start with a baby lemma, a small lemma. Suppose you have a cut, a AB cut. The lemma says the total amount of flow, net flow in the network is exactly equals to the net flow along the cut. First proof by example, bad way to prove, but let us see. What is the edges from A to B, from red to blue? What is the sum of the edges from red to blue? Red to blue. This is 1 and this is 1. Is there any other red to blue edges? Yeah. Some of them is 40 minus some of the flows that goes backward, blue to red, you 
Is there any all? Hmm? E to B. E to B flow is 0. Doesn't matter. So? What is the flow across the cut is 30. The sum of the flows out of A minus sum of the flows into A. What is the value of the flow in this network? This is the lemma. Baby lemma, which is intuitive, right? So, if you have a flow, then that flow has to pass this cut. Some of them will pass, some of them will come back. So total flow, if I take the difference, total flow will be has to be exactly equal to this. The same, if you have a line, there is a flow of 10 and there is a line where its flow is 5. The total flow from going from S to T, so this side you have S, this side you have T, has to be equal to 5. Common sense. This is a complicated example. Look at this example. So, this is the 20, but we are flowing 10, this is 10, we are flowing 5. So, what is the total flow? 10 is going from this direction, 5 is going back, that means the total flow is 5, has to be. This is true for any cut. But there is a formal argument as well. I start with this, I add some extra terms which will cancel out each other and finally, we have this. Add some terms which cancel out with each other because of the flow constraint. Total flow inside the vertex is total flow outside the vertex. Okay. You can check this when you are back. I will give you the all the PDFs and take any standard textbook, these things are there. But the idea is clear to you. So, with the baby lemma, now we have a major lemma, which is very useful. Again, it is very intuitive. It says that the value of any flow has to be less than the capacity of the cut. Do you agree? What is the intuition? Example of what? Tell. Is it possible to push a flow more than the capacity of the cut? It is impossible. It creates a bottleneck. If there is a edge from 10 going from some subset which contains S and some subset which contains T, it is not simply possible to push flow more than 10. T is the bottleneck edge. You see this bottle. Is it possible to flow more water than the capacity of the cap? It creates a bottleneck. Although here I can push a lot of flow, here I can push a lot of flow. But here, the flow that will come out of the bottle has to be less than the size of the or flow allowed through the cap. The proof is fairly easy. This is the definition of the flow that we have seen from the previous lemma. Just delete, omit this part, then we have this. And we know that flow is always less than the capacity. 
means we have this. So, do not look at this jargons. If you take a pencil and a paper, you can create this in half an hour time. But to try to concentrate on the idea. So, what we know? We know that the max flow for any flow is less than equals to the value of the cut, value of any cut. This is what it says. Hmm? Right? Can we say from here value of max flow is less than equals to value of any cut value of any flow is less than value of any cut. That means, value of the max flow is less than value of any cut. Take any flow F, value of that has to be less than any cut AB. Max flow is also a flow. The value of max flow has to be less than the value of any other cut. minimum cut. Hmm? That should be, but we should believe that the observations that we have, the observation that we have which says that the value of the max flow has to be less than equals to value of the mean cut. When we try to prove that A equals to B, one way to prove is A is less than B and B is less than equal to A, right? This is the one way to prove A equals to B, yes? Sorry, yeah, value of the cut means the capacity of the cut, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Still with me? Let me know if there, if there is any doubt. So, we have as a corollary of this weak duality lemma, we have proved that value of the max flow is less than equals to value of the mean cut. Now, suppose there exists algorithm. So, we know this, right? Now, suppose there exists an algorithm which promises to give you a flow which is equal to a cut. Suppose you have an algorithm which promises you to give a flow which is equals to the cut. Suppose I have algorithm say algo which produces a flow f which is equals to the value of some cut a b. What can I say about this flow? Then this algorithm has actually given me a max flow. Yes. 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 
So what do we have? A formal proof. How to do the formal proof? Suppose we have a flow which is equal to the capacity of the cut AB, some cut AB. Now what we have to do? What we have to prove that take any other flow F dash. What we can say that is less than equals to capacity of AB because any flow is less than any cut and what we know this is equals to value of F. So value of F dash is less than equal to value of F. Similarly take any cut other than AB, A dash B dash. What we know from the previous lemma that is greater than equals to F that is greater than equals to capacity of AB. That means AB is the mean cut. If a algorithm produces a flow which is equals to some cut, then the cut and the flow, the cut is the mean cut and flow is the max flow. Step by step. What we have proved first, then the capacity of a cut is always greater than equals to the value of the flow. From that, we get this. From that, we have the following corollary. Okay. Now, what remains to show? to complete the proof. Now go back to our algorithm. We got a flow. We need to show that that is exactly equals to some cut. We have done everything else. More formally, this is the max flow mean cut theorem which says that value of the max flow equals to capacity of the mean cut and indeed our algorithm gives us the max flow and the mean cut. To prove that we will show equivalence between these three statements that is we will show that 1 implies 2, 2 implies 3, 3 implies 1. Why 1 implies 2? That is what we have just proved. Right? Why 2 implies 3? But we will show that the contrapositive of 2 implies 3 that is not 3 implies not 2. What is the contrapositive of the statement? There exists an augmenting path that means it is not a max flow. Is not it trivial? If there is augmenting path in the residual flow, I can increase the flow. How can the current flow be maximum? Right? Let me know. If you are half confused, I am okay with it. If you are full confused, let me know. So 3 implies, we want to prove 2 implies 3, instead of proving 2 implies 3, we prove not 3 implies not 2, which is a contrapositive. Yes? Hmm? Oh, augmenting path is the path in the residual graph, where there is a residual capacity in the flow. So the red path here is the augmenting path, where you can augment some flow. So this is the residual network question there is a whether there is a ST path along which you can push some flow that is called the augmenting path. Here the red path is the augmenting path. Along the red path you can push a flow of value 10. So this is your network, this was your network. 
this is your network, right? Now, does there exist a ST path along which every edge has a positive capacity? Yes, S to B, B to A, A to T. Then this is called the augmenting path. Okay? So, if there is an augmenting path in the residual graph, can it be a max flow? If there is an augmenting path in the residual network, can it be a max flow? No, I will augment that, then I will increase the value of the flow. So, it is not possible. So, now we come to the fact, the correctness of the algorithm that now we have reached a situation where in the residual graph there is no augmenting path and our algorithm stops. Now, we have to prove that there exists a cut with capacity equals to the value of the flow, right. that is what we are trying to prove that this 3 implies 1. Clear your mind, what we are trying to do, we have done an algorithm, we reached a stage where there is no augmenting path, there is no ST path remain in the residual graph. Now, our objective is to show that there is a capacity such that the value of the flow is exactly equals to that capacity. capacity of the cut, there exists a cut such that the capacity of the cut is exactly equals to the flow that we have achieved, then we are done. How we will find the cut? Finding a cut means we have to find A, we have to find B. I define A to be the set of vertices which are reachable from S. In the residual graph and we know that there is no ST path remaining in the residual graph. We have reached a state where there is no ST path remaining in the ST path. So, I am looking for the vertices which are reachable from S, I am calling them A and rest of the vertices B. Does T belongs to A? No, because there is no residual, no augmenting path in the residual graph. So, T does not belongs to A. So, you get something like this. So, this is all the vertices that are reachable from S. And this is all the vertices which are not reachable from S and T is one of them this is my A, this is my B. What do you need, what I need to show? Value of the flow is equals to the capacity of the cut. What does it means? That means, I want to show that if there exists a path from A to B of capacity C, there is a flow of capacity C along the path and if there is a path from B to A with capacity say C dash, the flow in that path should, should be 0 if this is the situation. What is the value of the cut? Summation of the forward edges. What is the value of the flow? Summation of the forward edges minus forward flow minus the summation of the backward flow. If this is the situation, then the forward flow will be equal to the capacity of the forward arcs because C both are equal to C and how much flows is coming back? 0. So, that is what we are trying to prove. If there is a forward arc 
going from S to T that has that should saturate the capacity. How to prove that? Suppose it is not the case. And there is a forward arc like this. Is it possible? Call it U and V. This is not possible then why? Because in that case in the residual network V will be reachable from U. Is in the residual network what will be the value of the edge UV? The remaining capacity that is non zero. So, V will be reachable from S that means V will be in A not in B. So, this is not possible. So, this is this case is not possible. So, every edge which is going from A, A to B has to be saturated. Otherwise, the other vertex will remain reachable from S. What about this? Can this be happen? Suppose this is a backward edge from U to V. Can there be a positive flow of 5 from can there be a positive value of flow? Why not? So, this is the case. Then again there will be a edge from u to v like 5 in the residual network. So, v will be reachable from s again. Right? So, this is the situation we are in. So, we have in other words we have created a flow which is of the value equals to the cut that we have just presented. And what is the cut? You look at do a BFS find out all the reachable vertices from A in order and time you will find the cut. So, this algorithm will give you a max flow as well as a mean cut. <coughs> so, if there is a doubt you go through the lecture note it will be clear I think otherwise you pick up any standard textbook it is in every standard textbook covers this topic at least very well. But there is a problem in this whole algorithm. What is the problem? <coughs> what is the runtime of this algorithm? Hmm? What is changing in each step? We are finding a edge, finding a path, we are increase the flow by the bottleneck, bottleneck capacity of the edge of that path. What we are doing? We are finding a path in the augmenting graph. So, we are finding a path in the residual graph. Look at the minimum edge, value of the minimum edge in that path, we increase the flow by that amount. but that may be equals to 1, 1 unit. And how much time it will take to reach the maximum flow, how many steps? 
So we have star is the maximum flow. It will take time. Each step, how much we are incrementing? Minimum capacity of I h. To reach f star, how much steps we need? f star by minimum of capacity of E. And I do not have any bound on this quantity. So, the total runtime is this, but I am assuming this is equals to 1. So, total runtime remains this I am assuming that all the capacities are of integer value and the problem is I do not have any control over this quantity f star. f star can be very huge compared to the value of m and n. This is in some sense is a value which depends on input size not input values, but it does not depend on the input size. So, that is why this is called a pseudo polynomial time algorithm. So, there exists a polynomial time algorithm. The argument is little bit complicated, but what it does? it does exactly the same thing as this algorithm does, but with one difference. What we are doing here, we are choosing any augmenting path in the residual network. While executing the algorithm, we are choosing any augmenting path in the residual network. In that algorithm, what they do is, they choose a path with minimum hop distance or minimum vertex distance, a path which contains a minimum vertex among all possible paths. That guarantees a runtime of So, will not cover that algorithm here, but this is the basic idea. If you do that, instead of choosing arbitrary augmenting path, if you choose the minimum hop distance augmenting path, then that will guarantee your algorithm which runs in time order m square n, where m is the number of edges, n is the number of vertices. It is it's a very bad algorithm, again we can improve that but it, this is at least a polynomial time algorithm. So, that is all. Thank you.